Well, good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Thursday, January 16th, 2020. And our top store today, a look at US and global real estate markets. Well, real estate is often considered a very important asset class to have in any portfolio. And joining me now to discuss what happened in 2019 and what could happen in 2020 in the asset class known as real estate, Calvin Schnorr, Senior Vice President with the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts. Calvin, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Good to see you again. Well, it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, real estate, something that is obviously top of mind for many Americans, whether they be commercial or whether it be residential. But w would you mind just kind of summarizing and helping us understand what happened with real estate in 2019? 2019 was a very good year for real estate. It was also a good year for investing in REITs. We started the year, if you remember, with a lot of concerns of whether the global economy was going into recession and whether we were about to have a real estate downturn. And most people were pretty bearish on the market. Well, what we saw was not only did the overall economy do pretty well, the economy slowed during the year, uh, but the real estate market showed that it has a lot of momentum. We saw good earnings growth. We saw uh, low vacancy rates across all the major property types, um, and the REIT sector performed quite well. REITs delivered a total return of about 28% for the year, and that was a combination of good income growth for those investors interested in earning income, as well as a very strong capital gain. So in all, 2019 was a very good year for investing in real estate. Yeah, it, it sounds like, and from what you just said, and from what I've read, uh, absolutely. You know, one of the, the areas that has been some concern is when you look at some of these metropolitan areas, San Francisco comes to mind, maybe New York and maybe some other areas that I'm not aware of where residential prices have gone through the roof. And I'm just thinking about Silicon Valley and people don't have the opportunity to live there. Or if they do to rent, rent a, a house, you need to rent with like 10 other people. Is that something that it could possibly continue uh, going forward into 2020. I don't want to get into 2020 specifically, but that certainly has been a, was a problem in 2019. Well, San Francisco is kind of like what Yogi Berra said about the restaurant. Nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. <laughs> so San Francisco, certainly, it's a very hot market. It's a very tight market. And it's a market that doesn't have a whole lot of alternatives. Obviously, they're landlocked and they have zoning restrictions. And they're right next door to Silicon Valley. So there's a lot of demand and a lot of a lot of money going in there. Uh, you are seeing that the investments there are doing quite well. Um, if someone's coming to work there or start a business there, it can be very pricey. So we are seeing growing interest of, of tech businesses going to places like Colorado, going to Seattle, going to other cities. So some of the demand for commercial real estate in San Francisco is actually spilling out into some of the other areas. But in terms of the actual real estate market itself, I, it's really solid just because the overall desirability of the San Francisco market remains one of the top in the country. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned uh, zoning and zoning restrictions. Uh, one of the themes that we've been tracking here on the program is sustainable investing and you know, or better known as ESG. Um, is that a, a, an important issue that those in the real estate industry have to focus on? I, I would imagine that, you know, disrupting an area, whether an environmental area like a, you know, stream or brook or, or forest or disrupting an, an, an area would, would be important and therefore would uh, be something that many investors and people are thinking about. You know, REITs are among the leaders in sustainability and efforts in sustainability in commercial real estate. And we at NAREIT have been working very closely with industry in these efforts. So they take all three of the components of ESG very seriously, the environment, the social aspects, and the governance. Uh, NAREIT has a lot of materials on our website, REIT.com. If you look for the ESG dashboard, it can give information. But the, the really important thing to know is REITs are public companies and they're very transparent. So they provide a lot of information for what they're doing. If a tenant or if an investor is interested in knowing how the, the REITs, how the real estate industry is trying to reduce the impact on the environment and be resilient to climate change, NAREIT uh, is a good resource for that information. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I look at this site regularly and I don't propose to be an, an expert in uh, real estate by all means, but it's certainly very important, very uh, relatable information. Uh, Calvin, the other thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of 2019 uh, interest, <laughs> interest rates, uh, we saw the Federal Reserve, uh, I think, raise rates uh, and then lower rates. Um, what's, the, what's the relationship between the rate changes and what happened in the real estate market? Because I think there definitely is a relationship there. Well, I'd like to make two points about interest rates and investing in REITs. So the first is that actually the interest rate environment right now is very favorable. It's very favorable for real estate of all types. Uh, you have low long-term financing, and that's what's really important for a commercial real estate investor. Uh, the other point, though, is that these short-term fluctuations in interest rates really don't affect REITs very much. REITs have very strong balance sheets. They've actually lowered their leverage. REITs have the lowest leverage they've had in about 25 years. They've lengthened the maturity of their debt so that it's quite a bit longer than it was a decade or so ago. And what that means is their operations are really not exposed to the, the short-term changes in interest rates. Uh, and with a lower leverage, they really don't have much exposure to, to rates at all. So what this means is it's a favorable environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Rates would do well even if rates were higher um, because they're funded mostly by equity capital and they have a good solid capital cushion. And, and you know, when it talks, when you think about who invests in REITs or who invested in REITs from an institutional perspective, Calvin, you know, I just off the top of my head, you know, we, we're talking retirement on the show, but I, I got to think pension funds, uh, maybe 401k plans have access to REITs. Are there other pools of investors that maybe I'm not thinking about that would have these types of investments in their plan or in their portfolio? I would say all of the above. You're seeing uh, the defined contribution pension funds that a lot of us as workers uh, have our own accounts. Many defined contribution pension funds provide an option for investing in REITs. One of the most, tar uh, one of the most popular investments these days is the target date retirement fund. Yeah. So you don't have to rebalance your portfolio and adjust the risk between equities and fixed income and so on. And they look for diversification to reduce the risks. And most target date funds these days are including REITs in the portfolio uh, because it gives a good total return. It also gives income for re people as they approach retirement age, uh, as well as just uh, diversifying the portfolio. But you also see things like you know, sovereign wealth funds, you see the traditional defined benefit pension funds, uh, you see individuals just in investing in REITs. So given that they're a significant part of the economy and of the stock market, uh, most investment strategies have some role for investing in, in REITs. Yeah, and, I gotta, and I gotta think, Calvin, that you know, just based on my own reading, you know, most pension funds, most uh, large pool investors are not just looking at the traditional asset classes. When I say traditional, I mean stocks and bonds. They're actually looking at alternative types of investments. Would, you know, like a private equity or hedge funds or even direct real estate, would a REIT kind of fall into that category where you're, you know, it's not a traditional asset class in the, in the purest sense, but it can add additional layers of, of, uh, of um, alpha, or it can diversify a portfolio further? Well, I'd certainly agree that investing in income producing real estate, commercial real estate, income producing real estate is one of the essential, one of the core asset classes. Uh, the term alternative suggests that it's not a mainstream investment, but Burton Malkiel, who's famous for writing a random walk down Wall Street, he said there are four asset classes. Those asset classes are equity, bonds, real estate, and cash. So one of the real gurus of investing recognized that income producing real estate for its total return and diversification properties belongs in every portfolio. Yeah, yeah it sounds like it, it brings a lot of value, at least in 2019. Well, Calvin, I want to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to talk to Calvin about 2020. And we just started the year, of course, but we're going to get his sense for where real estate could be. And I want to underscore the word could be right here on BRN AM. So stay tuned, we'll be back in a few minutes. Stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, 
and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Welcome back. We're talking real estate this morning with National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, Senior Vice President, Calvin Schnorr. Calvin, thanks so much for sticking around this morning. Glad to be here. Well, we, we appreciate it. And thanks for kind of helping us understand, at least me understand, I, and I clearly need an education, about real estate and real estate investment trusts. I think many of our viewers probably learned a lot there. And we talked about 2019. Now, if you wouldn't mind, and I don't want to put you in a bad position, but let's talk about 2020 and how things potentially, I want to underscore the word potentially, could shape up for REITs and real estate going forward in 2020. Well, what we're looking at is a market that is, it's a mature market right now. I say a mature market in terms of the recovery from the financial crisis and recession that we had a decade ago. But I would not describe it the way some people do. Many people ask about late cycle risks. People say, what are the late cycle risks? Well, that presupposes that this is a somewhat predictable cycle where we could see a downturn. We're in the 11th year of this recovery, the overall economic expansion. And the important thing for commercial real estate is we don't see any of the types of imbalances that preceded past downturns. For real estate specifically, we're not seeing a whole lot of excess construction. We're seeing construction, we're seeing building, we're seeing building in uh, cities across the country, in offices and apartments and in industrial properties, but that building is in line with the growth of demand. So what that means is the vacancy rates are still low, rents are still rising, mm -hmm. and the property values are still high. So from an investor's point of view, if you're putting money into a REIT, if you're putting money into any commercial property, it has a pretty good prospect for the year or two ahead because it's not going to get swamped with new supply coming along in excess of the demand. So that, that lays the, the foundation for a good year for investors in 2020. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it. And, and I mean, to your point, from an economic point of view, the U.S. economy seems to be firing on all, on all cylinders, no matter how many times the bears come out and say, hey, things are, are, are not going to work out. Um, is it your sense, just from an economic point of view, that this run up, this uh, hotness of the market, for lack of a better term, will continue, at least in the early stages of 2020? I wouldn't use the term hotness. Yeah, um, well, firm, that's not a technical firm. term. It's, 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 it's a firm market. If I say a market is hot, yeah. I think of property prices rising very rapidly. And we did see commercial property prices rising by 10% or more uh, in, the, in the middle years of this recovery. They've since then slowed to the, the low single digits and property prices are rising in line with net operating income. And what that means is that property prices are pretty well aligned with income growth. So the market's not overheating. I, I mentioned earlier that overbuilding is one of the signs that you'd be worried about for a possible right. downturn. Overheating would be another one. And I'd, I'd right now say the prices are good, the prices are fair uh, and, and providing a good return, but there's, there's not this type of speculative pricing that makes you worried is the market ahead of itself. Yeah, so we're not going to get into that. We're not at the point in 
2007, 2008, where we had the speculative bubble. Uh, and we all know what, what happened as a result of that securitization of loans, et cetera, that really led to a significant downturn. Uh, Calvin, are there specific geographic areas of the country that are maybe more attractive or doing better than others when you, you know, look nationally at the United States? Well, in terms of the real estate market, the coastal markets have been strong for quite a while. And you look at the big cities, the San Francisco we mentioned earlier this morning. Yeah. So you look at uh, Boston, you look at a lot of the major cities, they're doing quite well. Um, and, and then the second tier of cities are also doing really well. Seattle has had a very strong market, but cities like uh, Austin, cities like Denver, cities like Atlanta, these are cities with a lot of job growth. People have been moving there. You have good demand for commercial real estate in those markets. Uh, there's some other parts of the country that are not quite as strong, but there really are not any parts of the country that are in what you would consider to be a downturn. So I would say the, the overall national picture is some markets are okay and some are quite strong. And then could you, you share a little bit about your perspective maybe internationally? I mean, I know it's the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, but are there areas of the globe that seem to be more attractive than others when you look in 2020? You know, right now, the U.S. market, the U.S. economy is still one of the strongest ones in the world. We obviously see Western Europe has had quite a bit of slowing, uh, whether countries are in recession or near recession. They are not on the same type of footing that you have in the U.S. Similar in Asia, China's growth has slowed quite a bit. Um, it's not it's, it's not a recession scenario because they just have this very rapid trend growth. They're, they're growing from a much lower level of income, but they have slowed quite a bit. And you're seeing through a lot of parts of the world, 2019 was a year of slowing. Uh, some countries slowing from above trend pace back to trend, but it's, it's been a slow market and the U.S. is still ahead of the pack here. Yeah, well, it's going to be an interesting year. And I know we just started, but there's so much going on around the globe. We just had a, a flare up. Uh, you know, geopolitical flare up. We've got things going on in Washington. We've got an election. So I can uh, assure you that we'll, we'll certainly be reaching out to get your perspective and has it, uh, how it all relates to the real estate market. Calvin Schnorr, Senior Vice President with the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trust. Thanks for joining us this morning. Have a great rest of the week and we will talk to you again very soon. Great. Looking forward to it. And that wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Hey, have a financial topic? or some of interest that you think we should interview, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the news in retirement, markets, technology, personal finance, and so much more, check out today's edition of The Morning Pulse. So until tomorrow, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.